the war crimes trials should have been more severe. We never raised the charges against Japan for their bombing of Chinese cities. Mm -hmm. And why did we not? We were afraid that, that people were going to raise the charge against the United States for, the bomb, for our, our bombing of Japanese cities, uh, as well as our uh, the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We let them off. Notorious reactionary General MacArthur became the de facto dictator of occupied Japan. Under U.S. rule, elite war criminals were allowed to escape trial. Some found guilty even returned to positions in the post-war government. The U.S. occupation tied an arm behind Japan's back by denying it a military, while resurrecting its industry as an economic surrogate. They adopted Article 9 of the Japanese Constitution. Article 9 is amazing. Article, under Article 9 in the Japanese Constitution, they renounced the right of war as a sovereign nation, and they renounced the right to have offensive military forces. This was the bedrock of the Japanese peace constitution from 1946 until this year. Finally, this year, the Abe administration has revoked Article 9. And effectively, uh, under this, this resolution adopted by the cabinet and passed by both houses of the Japanese parliament, uh, so the United States initially imposed this on Japan, but what happened is the Japanese people loved it. The Japanese people embraced it. And when during the Korean War, the United States tried to get Japan to revoke Article 9 so that the Japanese could help the Americans in the Korean War, the Japanese refused. And so there's been this struggle ever since where the United States has been encouraging Japan to do away with Article 9 so that Japan could form the backbone of what the United States is doing in Asia, and the Japanese people have resisted until now. Japan's current prime minister, Shinzo Abe, is nostalgic for the days of empire and is implementing drastic reforms to crack down on civil liberties and reassert the country's military might. Abe, in his party's historical revisionism, has drummed up a racist nationalist movement. Korean immigrants in segregated communities are faced with violence from anti-immigrant gangs. The, the Abe administration is a nightmare. The Abe administration is the realization of the dream of the LDP and Japanese right-wingers for decades. Uh, Abe, you remember, first got elected in 2007, and he tried to implement his nationalist program. The Japanese people resisted it, and he was forced out of office in a year. When he got re-elected this time, he played it smarter. And he initially went with Abenomics and the economic policy, which seemed to be working. We now know that Abenomics is a failure. The Japanese economy is doing very poorly. So whatever gains there were temporarily uh, have now been eroded. But it was later that he began to introduce his militaristic agenda. And he did so, the Abe, from the time he first got elected to the parliament in 1993, has been the driving force behind Japanese historical re-education. He, he and his right-wing allies are very concerned about this tendency to look critically on Japan's history. Uh, so he's tried to whitewash basically the rape of Nanjing, the policy toward China, the mistreatment of the other Asians and the aggressive policies toward the other Asians, defend the, basically defend the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Uh, and issues like the Korean comfort women, the Korean women who were forced into sexual slavery by the Japanese military is one of these hot button issues that Abe has been, he didn't come out and officially deny it, although over the years he's tried to downplay this and say this is what all armies do. So Abe has been key in the effort to revise Japanese history in the same way that Americans have done. But Abe also is completely dedicated to remilitarizing Japanese society. So Abe passed the secrecy laws uh, last year, despite the fact that they were opposed by 82% of the Amer Japanese public, Abe forced that through. He's uh, allowed the Japanese arms dealers to sell arms overseas. And one of the big things he's been doing is the fight over to trying to prevent the people of Okinawa from exercising their democratic rights to stop the relocation of the base. The island of Okinawa was the entry point of the U.S. invasion in 1945. After decimating 90% of the island's infrastructure, the U.S. military took it over and has occupied it ever since. 
Widespread opposition helped anti-base politician Yukio Hatoyama get elected as prime minister in 2009. When Hatoyama got elected in 2009, a great victory for the Japanese people, the Japan Democratic Party finally overthrew the rule of the LDP, the conservatives, the right-wingers. And one of the things that Hatoyama pledged to do in that, during that campaign was stop the base relocation in Okinawa from Futenma, where the big base is now, to Henoko in northern Okinawa, this pristine, beautiful area where they want to relocate the military base. And the Japanese, at least 80% or so of the Japanese people have come out against this repeatedly. And uh, so Hatoyama tried to block the base relocation. Obama, said, Obama basically smashed him. Obama, you think that Hatoyama, progressive ally, Obama would embrace him, just the opposite. Obama cut his feet out from under him, forced uh, Hatoyama to back down on his effort to block the base relocation. It basically eroded the popularity and the legitimacy of the Hatoyama government. Hatoyama regime collapsed, replaced by Khan. They had three, uh, three JDP uh, prime ministers. They, they couldn't function, they couldn't rule after that, and the JDP was replaced by Abe and the LDP, and we've seen this nightmare of militarization going on. I wanted you to create the context for our audience about Okinawa, because that is actually what radicalized me after reading Chalmers Johnson's book, Blowback, and this, talking about Okinawa and just the heavy militarization, people don't understand that literally the island is almost a giant base. That's how concentrated it is. Okinawa houses 74% of American military bases in Japan, and approximately half of the 50,000 American troops who are in Japan are in Okinawa. So Okinawa was where the fiercest battle in the Pacific was fought in 1945. And the Okinawans were victimized by the Japanese troops, victimized by the American troops. Then after the war, the US occupied Okinawa. So the Marines ran the entirety of Okinawa. And they set up bases wherever they wanted. So it was used, it was used for training it was also used as a launch point for the American empire. So it was a launch point for the US uh, invasion of Vietnam, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan. So they've often gone out from Okinawa to build the American empire in the Pacific. When I met with Al Magleby, who was the US Consul General, the highest American official in Okinawa, Magleby said no other piece of real estate is so strategically important as Okinawa. And he said, crucial to America's uh, vision and the, the Asia pivot and American empire, American forces throughout the Pacific. So they, he said, we're gonna fight, we're gonna hold this. The Japanese government is supporting the US space relocation. Okinawa reverted officially from American control to Japanese control in 1972, but it has never been able to exercise its democratic rights. The ominous presence of 32 military bases has violated Okinawan culture and the environment. From spilling 13,000 tons of poison gas to the 25-year cover-up of poisoning waterways with toxic chemicals, this 60-plus year military occupation has also created a legacy of sexual abuse, corruption, and impunity, rife with sexual assaults committed by U.S. military personnel. Between 1972 and 2015, police stats cite U.S. forces committing 26 murders and 129 rapes. Accountability is virtually non-existent, with U.S. immunity from any crimes or environmental destruction committed on Japanese soil. According to a FOIA request, in a review of hundreds of cases, rapists were only fined, demoted, or restricted to their bases. In 30 cases, a letter of reprimand was the only punishment. But a fire has been awakened in the Okinawans, and the protests against U.S. militarism continue to grow. In 2010, 100,000 people fought against the construction of a new base. Tensions reached a boiling point earlier this year, when a U.S. Marine admitted to raping and killing a 20-year-old local woman. In response, over 65,000 Japanese rallied to demand the removal of all U.S. military bases from the island, with signs reading, Our fury has gone beyond the limit. The Japanese people aren't just fighting the presence of the U.S. military, but the resurgence of the Japanese military. Mass protests against changing Article 9 shows the deep opposition to another path of war. 
Abe's New Japan quickly deployed thousands of troops to oil-rich South Sudan and routinely launches provocations against China, a country where it committed massacres not long ago. There's no telling where Japan's imperial ambitions might lead. And it coincides with the so-called Asia pivot, a calculated U.S. buildup against China, not because it poses a military threat, but because it poses an economic threat to U.S. business. Abe's administration is super militaristic, far right wing. I, I wanted to talk about what confrontations that you see playing out in terms of the U.S. Asia pivot toward Japan when Japan is seemingly wanting to become another empire. The U.S. Asia pivot, you remember who really announced the U.S. Asia pivot? It was Hillary Clinton. She wrote the article in Foreign Policy magazine, November of 2011, titled America's Pacific Century say basically that the United States is going to pivot. We focus too long on the Middle East. It's time that we focus more on Asia. We're going to recalibrate. Our forces are going to be moved toward Asia, away from Europe and the, and the Middle East. And this is where the 21st century is going to be. Unfortunately for the United States, reality got in the way. And so we've gotten bogged down. The reason why Obama really said that he wanted to wind down the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan was so that we could focus more on Asia with this Pacific pivot. And we've done some of that. The TPP and our new trade arrangements are partly an attempt to rebalance toward the Pacific. Uh, we've, we've had uh, war exercises, uh, war games with the, Europe, with the Asian nations. We've gotten a lot of them to increase their defense spending, effectively buying their military, their weapons and defense systems from the American arms manufacturers. So the profiteers are drooling over all of this. What we're looking to is Japan and other Asian allies to basically be proxies for us, to, to take the burden, take responsibility for controlling and containing China. The, the model is really what Kennan talked about in terms of containment toward Russia during the Cold War. In the same way, we're trying to surround China, we're trying to lock in China, to limit China, is going to lead these other countries into a hardline stance against China and build up the right wing in Japan and other countries. On the one hand, we're forcing China into this tighter alliance with Russia. On the other hand, we're building up this opposition to China. This, this, this crazy confrontation of the uh, Senkaku, the Ayu Islands between Japan and China, the U.S. sending its ships to challenge China in the South China Sea. The United States hasn't, hasn't taken an official position on Japan and China in the Senkaku, the Ayu Islands. However, Obama has said if there is a military confrontation between Japan and China over the islands, the United States is going to come to Japan's aid. We saw how that worked out in 1914 with all these entangling alliances and how that led to World War I. Well, that same situation still exists. It's a very dangerous situation. I mean, these are potential powder kegs.